believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. I believe a person comes into a right relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe the Bible is the Word of God and has the right to command my belief and action. I believe I am significant because of my position as a child of God. Good morning, Westside family. Uh, whether you're here in the North Room, in Lenexo, or the South Room, or over at the Speedway, or all around the world on the internet, we're on this Believe journey together. And that means we've been reading the Old Testament every single week. Way to go. And if you've been reading it, you may have noticed that all the ancient people groups, their names kind of sound the same. Have you noticed that? There's like the Moabites, right? The Amalekites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the I think I'll have a bites, the stalactites, the stalagmites, they're all in there. Bad Pastor Joe, come on, you know. <laughs> Gotta go for it if you can. And it makes you wonder, these other nations that were around, what happened to them? Like, you don't work with any Moabites. Have you noticed that? There, there's no Amalekites on your street. And what's interesting is these other little nations that existed that were equivalent to Israel in the ancient world, they're gone. Now there's vast uh, civilizations like Egypt and Greece that have remained to this day, but these other ancient people groups, they've disappeared from the pages of history. How did Israel survive? One of my favorite historians, his name is Thomas Cahill, and he says in his book, The Gift of the Jews, not only did they survive, they literally shaped the course of Western civilization. In fact, in the subtitle of his book, The Gift of the Jews, he asked this question, how did a tribe of desert nomads change the way the world thought and felt? That's no small thing. And what was it about Israel that allowed them to be a people who exist while all these other equivalent nation states disappeared? Well, it wasn't power during most of Israel's history. They were just a vassal state of much greater nations. It wasn't their military strength. They never even really had a standing army, per se. It wasn't their great wealth. They were never more than a blip in the ancient world in that world economy. I mean, what was it about Israel? Why do they exist, and how did they manage to influence the way the entire world thinks and feels? What did Israel have? They had a book. And not just any book, they had the book. It was their most prized possession. They called it, in the Hebrew, the Tanakh. And it was their way of summarizing the three parts of the scripture, the Hebrew word T and N and K, and it described the three portions of the scripture, the, the Torah, and then the writings, and then the prophets, and they called it the Tanakh. And it's a fun word to say. If you say it right, there's a little spittle that comes out and hits the back of the neck of the person in front of you. So I want you to do this. It'll be fun. We're going to say it together, Tanakh, on the count of three. One, two, three, Tanakh. Spray it. Yeah. Kind of wakes you up in the morning. And oh, how they loved the Tanakh. They never lost their sense of awe because they realized in the Tanakh they had the inspired word of God. And, and these words... They were unlike anything that had been heard before in the world. For example, what was common in the ancient world was that there was this pantheon of little tribal gods and they're all fighting and competing. And then because of the Tanakh, the world discovered that there is one true God. And that he is good and loving. That he is just and he is holy. And in the ancient world, it was considered humanity was basically the dust on the bottom of the feet of the little G gods. But then the Tanakh introduced this idea 
that actually humanity was created in the image of God, that we have this tremendous value and splendor and responsibility that we were born on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose. In other words, that God is involved in and cares about our daily lives. And that was brand new. It was a brand new idea that God wanted a relationship with us, but that we had broken that relationship and we stand in need of a savior and that history wasn't just this, in the ancient world, history wasn't going anywhere. It was just this wheel, this cycle repeating over and over and over again with the gods up there and humanity down here and the Tanakh spoke and said, no, history is a story. It's God's story. It's a story of creation, fall, redemption and restoration and that it's heading somewhere. That God has not only created all things, he's going to restore all things. And it was the first time in history we actually had a story where we were joining God and moving towards a better and brighter future. Now, these things have become so commonplace for us that we don't even notice it anymore. It's hard for us to even imagine how different the world was in the past. But the ideas that are the fabric of Western civilization, please listen, ideas like personal liberty and freedom and hum, the value of the human life. This idea that history is meant to move towards progress and wholeness and advancement. The ideas that are the very fabric of Western civilization, they did not come, these ideas did not come from the Vedas or the Quran. It didn't come from the sayings of Buddha. It came from the Tanakh. It came from the book. And all of us live in a completely different world where we think and feel differently because of this little people group called the Israelites. And what made them stand out from all the other nations of the world? It's because they had the book. And oh, how they loved the book. Oh, how they reverenced the book. There were so many ways that they reverenced it. Like, just let me give you a couple examples. One of the things that was a tradition during an engagement, if there was a, a, a wannabe groom, what he would do is he would make basically application. And there would be a test to see if he was worthy of the bride. And they would test him, guess what they would test him on? The Tanakh. That's what they test him on. And the more beautiful the bride, the more wealthy the bride, the higher the score you had to have on the Tanakh. So in other words, it was the only education system where if you pass the test, you lose your bachelor's degree. I thought that was a good one. And why did they reverence the book so? Because they realized God's people are the people of the book. Can I get an amen? And they lived every day guided their beliefs and actions by the book. And they were even willing to die for the book. Josephus, a Jewish historian at the time of Christ, describes and tries to explain the passion of God's people as the people of the book. He said these words time and again, we have given practical proof of our reverence for our own scriptures. It is an instinct with every Jew from the day of their birth to regard them as the decrees of God, to abide by them, and if need be, cheerfully die for them. Time and again, the sight has been witnessed of prisoners enduring torture and death rather than utter a single word against them. What Greek would endure as much for the same cause? The Romans wouldn't do it. The Greeks wouldn't do it. But the Israelites never got over this sense of awe that they had the inspired word of God in their hands. And this is our legacy. This is the story we find ourselves in. And see, God's people have always been the people of the book. But the question comes to each one of us, who are we the people of? I mean, today, who are we the people of? What is it that influences the way we see the world? Where, where do we spend most of our time gaining information or inspiration? You know, Are we the people of the book or are we really actually the people of the Netflix or the people of the Facebook? What is it that shapes our worldview? Are we the people of the Fox News? Are we the people of the Huffington Post? What people are we? And see, what we're reclaiming through this belief journey is that God's people are the people of the book. That's who we are. And we, and sure, we may participate in Facebook and Netflix and Fox News and Huffington Post, but that is not our ultimate guide or authority for our beliefs and our actions. It is the word of God. And so I want to ask you to consider again with me today, 
what that means. See, all of us here as Americans, we live under the power of the Constitution in the United States. But the Constitution only finds its authority by us opting in. You know, we basically, as a people, we agree to abide by it. But by contrast, God's people have understood the book derives its authority not from our consent. It derives its authority because it has been inspired by God. And I want to invite you to say with me today, today's key belief, today's key idea. Again, I'm going to block it because I know a bunch of us are... Uh, trying to memorize it, so let's say it out loud together. I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God that guides my beliefs and actions. Amen. And we're going to look at why would we believe that and what does that mean for us. And today's key scripture is from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. If you know it, say it out loud with me. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God wants us equipped to go into our day ready so that our beliefs and our actions aren't first and foremost inspired or informed by whatever our culture is saying or whatever happened in my broken family system or whatever my best friend thinks or whatever Oprah said or Jordan Peterson said. But I'm standing on the word of God. The very words of God. And so if you will look in your believe book, if you have it with you, turn to page 69 uh, it says this, again, about the nature of the book that we're holding. You'll see it there at the bottom in the bold. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Carried along by the Holy Spirit. And Paul says it is God-breathed. It, the, in the Greek, it's theonoustos, theo God, noustos is breath or pneuma, and it's connected to a Hebrew word, ruha, which is in Genesis 2 7, where it says, God, ruha, he breathed life into humanity, and we came alive. And, and, and the scriptures are unique in the entire library of history. It is the book that God has, theonoustos, that he has ruhad into. And there's a special authority and a special life and a special power that God's people as the people of the book embrace and live in. And I know this is increasingly unusual in our day. And I want you to see that there was this man in particular, I think he's a man you can trust, who embraced the authority of God's word as his inspiration and his the dedication to guide all of his beliefs and his actions. His name was Jesus, and he was a man of the book. And I want you to see the high level of reverence, the unique place that Jesus gave the word of God in his life. Jesus reverenced this book. Write this down. I'm going to bolt these at you. See, for this reason, Jesus consistently uses the phrases Scripture says and God says interchangeably. In other words, they're equivalent. We're dealing with the Word of God. For this reason, Jesus held that Scripture cannot be broken. If I break the Scripture, I am going to end up breaking myself because the Scripture cannot be broken because it's true. For this reason, Jesus taught until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter. Not one stroke of the letter. So that part that I don't like, that I want to edit out of the book, Jesus said, not one letter, not one stroke will pass. That's Matthew 5, verse 18. Look at this. For this reason, Jesus based his teachings and stories on hundreds of references to the Old Testament. It absolutely immersed his worldview. 
And for this reason, when people were in error on theological matters, Jesus said it was because they didn't know the scriptures well enough. That's Matthew 22, verse 29. Do you see the reverence Jesus has for the book? And for this reason, this is the most profound one for me, Jesus considered himself the interpretive key of the scripture, to the scripture. In John chapter one, Jesus is called the word of God. It's one of his titles for his deity. And see, the word of God says, if you want to understand the written word of God, he is the Rosetta Stone. He is the decoder to help you understand. When we read this book, it is inspired. And it's like when you're sitting, let's say you go to Nelson Atkins, and you're sitting in front of this great work of art, and you're captivated by the beauty, and it starts working on you. Imagine if in that moment the artist could step through the painting and begin to speak to you. See, that's what happens when we read the word of God. We're captivated by the written word. We have an experience of beauty and wonder and awe if we truly come under it. And then it's also this portal, this channel through which the written word introduces us to the living word, Jesus. And the artist speaks through the written word and it changes us. It's not so much us mastering it as it is the book mastering us. And look at how Jesus describes it. Again, uh, look at page 67, if you will, in your Believe book. This is post-resurrection. And look how Jesus interprets the scriptures. Up at the top there in the bold, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And, And then look down. At the bottom, Jesus said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures and those disciples as they were, as they were listening to Jesus interpret the Bible. They said, didn't our hearts burn within us? And there's a, there is a mystical experience that the people of God have had for centuries where the written word of God and the living word of God encounter us and change us and our hearts burn within us. And Jesus so surprises us. He's the ultimate revelation of God. And he reinterprets all of the passages that came before him and all the passages that come after him. And he does it in such a a surprising way. A couple of my favorite movies have these really big twists in them that make you reinterpret the whole story. One of them is uh, the book of Eli with Denzel Washington. And another one is The Sixth Sense with Bruce Willis. And you get to this moment in both those movies where there's this illumination, there's a climax, and there's this scene where there's a revelation and where you realize, wait a second, the whole story that I thought was happening was not the story that was happening. And now there's this new insight, this new revelation, and you literally have to reinterpret the whole movie and everything that came before it. And you're like, whoa! When I saw The Sixth Sense, it was, uh, it was the opening weekend, packed movie theater, and when that scene happened, and I won't spoil it for you if you haven't seen it, he was dead the whole time, all right? <laughs> and when that moment, when the reveal happened, I'm not kidding, a hundred something people in that movie theater, they all sucked air. You could literally hear them, they all went, oh, no way! And there was one guy, one rode down for me, and he, he, he literally cussed. He was like, blankety blank, out loud like that. You couldn't believe it, you know, it got me. And you had to reinterpret that whole movie. And people went back and they would rewatch the movie to go, I, oh, I didn't see that, you know? And that's exactly what Jesus did. The Bible's not a series of disconnected stories. It's one story where all the stories and all the characters are pointing towards one person, Jesus. And see, the whole Old Testament leads up to and is fulfilled in Jesus. But the particular way that Jesus fulfills it reframes everything. And hardly anyone saw it coming. I mean, the religious leaders, the way Jesus reinterpreted the story of God and his dealings with Israel was so unexpected, they couldn't receive him as a Messiah. In fact, they crucified him and played right into God's plan. And what's amazing is the Old Testament develops a storyline preparing us for Jesus. And then the New Testament fulfills that storyline, portraying Jesus. And as we read both the Old Testament and the New Testament, 
through the lens of Jesus Christ crucified, we will understand the whole story the way God wants us to. And according to Jesus, please listen, the book, Jesus says it is the authoritative source. If you wanna know who God is, if you wanna know who you are, if you wanna know what God has done and what God is doing and what God is going to do, this is the authoritative source. It is the inspired word of God. And bottom line, if it's in the Bible, if it's interpreted through the lens of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, Jesus assumed it has divine authority to guide and command our beliefs and actions, and it would do the same in the life of his followers. Can I get an amen? amen. So the question is, if Jesus reverenced the book this way, is the ultimate authority for faith and practice, do I? Do I? So let me give you a little um, context. Let's bring up this continuum. Uh, every year, a research group called Barna, they do what they call the State of the Bible Survey to figure out where Americans stand on the Bible. And we're actually at a very unique time in our history as a nation. In this continuum, at one end, you have what you could call the non-authoritative view of Scripture. This is where folks see it as kind of myths, legends, mixed in with a little bit of history. At best, you might be able to get some good moral principles out of it. At worst, like new atheists like Christopher Hitchens say, no, this is toxic. This is poison to humanity. It's keeping our minds enslaved. That's one end of the continuum. At the other end, I've tried to make, in a brief amount of time, a compelling argument that Jesus had an extraordinarily high view of Scripture. He saw it as absolutely authoritative, that it was the inspired word of God, that it does command his followers all their beliefs and action. So the first time in American history, we're actually equal at both ends of the continuum. About 20% of the population hold this high view of scripture. About 20% of the population hold this non-authoritative view of the scripture. And then in between, there's another like 20, I think it is 7% around here. And then the other 30% falls in this range. They, they, they respect and reverence the scripture, maybe not quite at the same level that Jesus does. Now, we've done the reveal survey, remember? Not too long ago. And our, our stats are a little bit different. We're about 55% up here. And then there's about 45% of us that kind of range here. And I, I just think that's important for us to um, understand about where we are as a family. And if, in particular right now, if you're one of those folks that you're, you're here, because you want to learn the scriptures, you have a reverence for Jesus, but you're unsure about the Bible. You're kind of like in the middle of the continuum, maybe even towards the left end of the continuum. First of all, I want you to know I, I respect your doubts and your questions. They may pull my pastor card for telling you this, but I've spent a lot of time asking questions down at this end of the continuum. I mean, I've, I've wrestled with the scriptures for 30 something years and, and I have, I'm the kind of person who's very inquisitive, I'm very curious. I actually like read books and listen to podcasts from critics and atheists on a regular basis because I don't want to be afraid. I, I want to live out in the open and if something is true, it should endure rational uh, conversation and inquisition. And Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so I just want to say, I respect your doubts and your questions. And I want to speak to you in particular just for the next few moments. And I want to present to you, why is it that I have all these questions and I've spent a lot of time dealing with them, but I land here at this end of the continuum. And you're going to have to like strap on your helmet and your seatbelt because we're going to go really fast. Are you ready? Okay. And I'm just going to start this conversation and then give you some places where you can go in and dig in a little bit more deeply. Are you ready? ready? All right, here we go. First of all, here's why I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. The first reason is this, the transforming power of the scriptures, the transforming power of the scriptures. This book has transformed millions, yay, billions of people. It has taken death row convicts and made them saints. It has taken literally slave drivers and made them abolitionists. It has taken greedy men and making them exceedingly generous. It has taken prostitutes and turned them into evangelists. I could go on and on and on. And in my own life, 
I see my own bentness and brokenness, my, my tendency to go towards self-destruction and arrogance, and it's taken this prideful, driven, selfish, narrow-minded man, and it has begun to open me up to be more selfless and kind and thoughtful and reflective. And if you don't believe me, you can ask my wife and kids, ask my best friends. I am changing, and you wanna know why? I eat this book daily, that's why. And a lot of us were settling for a once a week meal. That's called starvation. And I wanna encourage you, I know this is an argument from experience, but I wanna encourage you, if you're down at this end, you're here on Sunday mornings, so that's awesome. You're not gonna actually experience the full transformative power by just a once a week meal. You're gonna have to start to eat daily. It's not too late to get a believe book and see as you begin to eat daily, see if it doesn't begin to work on you, if you don't experience the power of it. And it's not just an argument from experience. If you look at history, I know people have misused the scriptures, but when people are rightly interpreting it through the lens of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, I'm telling you, all the great social justice movements in Western civilization, go do the research for yourself. They were led by followers of Jesus who were rightly interpreting this book. I'm talking things that are normative now, like the creation of an education system, health system, followers of Jesus interpreting this book rightly. The abolition of slavery. It was led by followers of Jesus who were interpreting this book rightly. You look at the women's suffrage movement, led by people who are interpreting this book rightly. Adoption of foster care systems. The, uh, child labor laws. Like I could go on and on and on. I encourage you to go research it for yourself. This book has so elevated humanity that we can't imagine what the world would be like without its influence, and we wouldn't want to, thank you very much. The transforming power of the Bible. Here's the second reason. The unity of the Bible's message. The unity of the Bible's message. Many support the inspiration of the Bible by emphasizing the unity of its message that runs through this entire collection of writings, 66 books written by 40 authors over 1,500 years of time. How could something like that even be cohesive? Listen, they're all writing at different times and different cultural perspectives. They didn't have access to all the other writings. Are you with me? And yet somehow there is this brilliant unity of genius that runs through the story of the Bible. Yeah, sometimes there's these kind of in-house fighting inside of the Bible because God is healing his, the image of him in his people's hearts and that's evolving over time and we can only take so much or otherwise the rubber band would break. Are you with me? But if you look and you begin to study, you're going to see thousands of clues, like threads that are woven together over hundreds of years of time through all these different authors. And it's in the unitive brilliance is absolute genius. I mean, I am overwhelmed by it. It's like no one could pull this off. There's, there's no way. There has to be a capital A author who's working through all these other authors to bring this brilliant capital S story about who God is and who we are and what he's done and what he's doing and where he's going. And as you go through believe, you're going to experience that. You're gonna be able to see that for yourself. Here's the third reason. Archaeological confirmation of scripture. Many support the inspiration of the Bible by pointing out that time and time again, archaeology has ended up confirming aspects of the biblical record. For example, critics once used to just thrash the Bible because it talked about the Hittites. And, all, and everybody said, there's no evidence at all that Hittites ever existed. But in the last century, the archaeological discoveries have proven that the Bible was absolutely correct about that. And there are literally hundreds of similar examples to the point where even some of the staunchest critics of the Bible have had to acknowledge, and most especially the Gospels, that they have proven so accurate, far accurate than any had expected. Now, at the same time, I'll give you this, archeology span only demonstrates that aspects of the biblical narrative are accurate, not that they're divinely inspired, but it's still compelling. And yes, there's still tension points between the biblical record and archeology, span I'll give you that, but overall, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples that show this isn't just myth, this isn't just legend, that this is a theological interpretation of history that is grounded in real places, in real time. And I think that's very compelling. Here's the fourth thing, the argument from prophecy. One of the most frequent arguments throughout history used to support biblical inspiration is the hundreds of fulfilled prophecies. Using all the tools that historians use, 
you can see clearly when these different documents were written, there was no like sleight of hand going on. And these documents that were written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. I mean, there's fulfilled prophecy after prophecy where that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would suffer a shameful, agonizing death, that he would be buried among the wealthy, that he would be crucified and executed as criminals. It just goes on and on and on. And these fulfilled prophecies are exceedingly difficult to explain, except for divine inspiration. And here's the last one, the testimony of Jesus. And in my estimation, this is the strongest argument supporting biblical inspiration. It's the testimony of Jesus. So let me state this argument very briefly. I find that there are a number of very compelling historical reasons for accepting that Jesus is the Son of God. For example, if you subject the Gospels to the same sort of rigorous testing that historians do of any ancient documents, you'll see that the Gospels... They pass those tests for historical veracity with flying colors. In fact, they stand head and shoulders above all other ancient documents. I encourage you to, if you have doubts, to do this research for yourself. So we have in the Gospels a historical accounting of the life of Jesus. And then from there, I also find it impossible to dismiss as historically unreliable the claims of the early disciples about Jesus. Now, the summer before last, I did an entire 45-minute message uh, where I unpacked why I believe the resurrection is a historical event. And if you're at this end of the continuum down here on the left, I encourage you to go watch that this week. You can see the YouTube listing in your notes. Because here's what it comes down to for me. I believe Jesus is the resurrected Son of God. And that the resurrection is a historical event. And I have good reason to believe that. And if you watch that, I think it'll start you on a journey where you can dig in and go, you know what? There is good historical reason to believe this. And this this is where I land then. If Jesus is the resurrected son of God who conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave, he is God in the flesh, and he references the book as the authoritative inspired word of God, I'm in. I'm in. And, and, And let me ask you, I mean, here's what it comes down to. Here's the bottom line. All of us choose an authority for our life. Am I right? that guides and commands our beliefs and actions. And see, I choose Jesus and I choose his word. And I can't find any other better options on the table. I mean, how about you? Is it gonna be Jesus or Oprah? You know, is it gonna be Jesus or Jordan Peterson? Is it gonna be Jesus or your favorite YouTuber? Is it gonna be Jesus or your college professor? Is it gonna be Jesus or Buzzfeed? Is it gonna, what's it gonna be? We all decide. And see, God's people are the people of the book. And now it's our turn to decide for ourselves. Will we be the people of the book? And for, and for you, if you're at this end of the continuum, I'm just saying, You owe it to yourself to dig in on this one. Again, this is a safe place. Am I right, church? This is a safe place for anybody, wherever you're at in your spiritual journey. We're thrilled that you're here, but we do want to ask you to don't just settle in for whatever the culture is telling you about the Bible. Do the work. Because God's people are a people of the book. Can I get an amen? All right. (laughs) Go, little brother, little sister, wherever you're at. And now I had to skip a bunch of stuff in the notes, so all you type A people, you're going to be up all night. Just deal with it. That's how it goes. I had so much more good stuff to share with you. But in closing, I want to invite you to just stand with me. And uh, let's recite today's scripture out loud together in closing. It's this. All scripture is inspired by God and it is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God might be proficient, equipped for every good work. And if it's in you, I invite you to say out loud with me, we are the people of the book. Here we go. We are the people of the book. May you this week 
walk with the living word of God and encounter him in the written word of God. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Go in grace and peace.